As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Does your family ever get exasperated with you for stockpiling such things as paper towels, bottled water, or toilet tissue? Well, they certainly can't object to you stockpiling money. Silver, the only money recognized by the U.S. Constitution. And your first 10-ounce bar of pure silver can be had at spot price with no premium by going to sdbullion.com rp. And when you buy it that way, you'll be supporting Reluctant Preppers as well by going to sdbullion.com rp. Thanks. Hey, Reluctant Preppers. If you haven't heard, we've already started our monthly one ounce U.S. Silver Eagle thank you gift to one active Patreon subscriber each month, signed by your host, Dunnigan Kaiser. And you don't want to miss out on that. Please help us grow by subscribing today at patreon.com slash reluctant preppers. Welcome back, reluctant preppers. It's been over a year since we've had this returning guest on Brother John F., famous for his tagline silver for the people has had a whole new venture since we've talked with him last brother john f thank you for joining us here again on reluctant preppers hey it's great to be back down here you were legendary in the early days of uh, populist silver accumulation by so many people there was uh the boycott uh when uh, silver seemed to be getting suppressed and uh, the idea was that the more people common people that could purchase silver, the more physical we take out of the hands of those who wanted to use paper contracts to suppress the price. Can you talk to us about what you have seen going on in the silver market for the past year since we've had you on, what you believe the major forces are that are in effect that are driving that, and where you see that going next? Sure. Well, the silver market, unfortunately, is still dominated by the powers that be, and and much to my personal disappointment, I, I and many others have been unable to convince uh, even, a, even a large minority the importance of stacking physical silver. Um, just the, the way it is, the way people operate with markets, and that's the reason why people are continually fleeced by the powers that be, is that people want to buy something that's going up, and they don't buy value. So the Warren Buffetts of the world, um, they're a very small percentage. You know, they're, they're not that many people who go out and look and say, okay, what is this thing worth? Uh, what's its true value? Why is that not reflected in the real world? What, you know, what is its potential and where's a good price to get in at? That's not how people invest. The way people invest is they buy what's going up. And that works great until it doesn't work. And so all those people right now, they're all in the stock market. Um, I think that Americans save, quote unquote, save 6% of their income. It amounts to roughly a trillion dollars a year. Pretty much all that money goes right into stocks. And uh, it would only take... I, I don't know, do some easy math. I think if you look at the Silver Institute's numbers that uh, 800 million roughly are pulled out of the ground, 800 million ounces are pulled out about every year. About 200 million of those are coins and bars. So 200 million times, what, 15 bucks is $3 billion, something like that. So Americans are spending a trillion dollars on pieces of paper and they're spending about 3 billion on pieces of silver. That's just the reality. Um, that's probably not going to change until it's too late. And actually, Thanks. a lot of those people that think that they, when you say pieces of paper, I, my mind was leaping to fiat currency, but you were actually talking about stock certificates. However, most people that think they own stocks, as other guests on our show have talked about, don't really own the stocks. They're held in street name by default. So your, bro your broker is actually doing whatever they want with your stocks or with those stocks on the back. You've just become an unsecured creditor. <laughs> Yeah, most people are, are like two or three or four levels away from actual ownership. I mean, they own uh, um, a 401k, which holds mutual funds, mm -hmm. which holds uh, maybe a hedge fund or maybe another fund. And then that holds the stock certificates or says it holds them, 
which could be rehypothecated or counterfeited or I mean the whole thing is just a joke. Um, you know, we've talked about and joked about the fact that they had that Hurricane Sandy come there and wipe out the DTCC because they left the door open and the, then it was on Water Street and the water came flooding in, but that didn't destroy everything, so they had a fire. I mean, it, you know, you can't make this stuff up. So, you know, the DTCC is some private own some private company owns them and they clear all this stuff and it's all just a gigantic sham. And of course, when it comes tumbling down, you know, people are gonna people are gonna want heads to roll, and you know, they're gonna be screaming and yelling. But it's gonna be too late. And when physical silver, you know, if and when this ever happens, it's been a long time coming. If there's actual run on real hard assets, that there isn't gonna be enough to go around. So, you know, the door is not gonna be small enough to get out when the fire starts for paper assets and the door is, I mean, isn't going to be big enough and the door isn't going to be big enough for everybody to get in when uh, the panic starts to get into physical assets. That's just the nature of the beast. And the public will be buying like they were buying at 50 bucks in 1979, $50 an ounce silver and $850 an ounce gold. Right when the, uh, was the beginning of a long, what 30 year bear market in precious metals or 20 year bear market, precious metals. And uh, that's that's the way the public is. They they get in at the top, lose all their money, don't get in at the bottom. So that that's what I'm looking at with silver. How how close are we to that? I think we're getting we're definitely closer. I think we're getting pretty close. Silver's definitely perked up a little bit. Gold and silver are behaving properly with with stocks rolling over, with the bond market rolling over. Um, but again, there's a lot of indicators now that that a recession is very, very close. And uh, so it might rally and then take another hit. We'll just have to watch it. Yeah, earlier when you were talking about before, it sounded like you were describing the difference between momentum trading or momentum quote unquote investing versus contrarian or value investing. And I guess that's why it's called contrarianism is because you're going against the crowd. Right, if the crowd, you know, if the crowd knew what silver was worth, it wouldn't be the price it's at. So the crowd is out of that trade. You just mentioned a minute ago uh, stocks rolling over and bonds rolling over and some signs that were coming near to a recession. Can you want to hit those three in order? Uh, what are you, We definitely have seen after the uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average hit a peak uh, in January, then a big rough uh, uh, first quarter, and, and it's just kind of been going sideways and up and down, a lot of volatility through most of the year, then finally returning to its peak and now down again. So is that what you're talking about? Are you talking about the internals versus the leaders uh, in that market? Can you describe to us more about that? Yeah, well, there's a few things. I mean, um, the technical picture on the Dow and the NASDAQ and the Russell 2000 and S&P 500 major indices is pretty bearish. I mean, if you draw a trend line from the last kind of bottom we put in around 2016, uh, it looks to be looks to be breaking down. Um, we're, you know, about 10% down from the highs on, on the Dow and the NASDAQ. And uh, the, the technical picture looks pretty ugly. I mean, you put that together with the um, interest rate environment. I mean, the traditional rule for interest rates and in stocks was, and, you know, almost all the rules have been thrown out since the last recession, but the traditional rule was three steps and a stumble. So generally, if once the Fed had raised rates three times, you would uh, then see a reaction downward in the stock market, which is just the natural reaction of people beginning to migrate their investments towards uh, bonds and away from stocks because as interest rates rise the yield on bonds becomes more appealing and uh, the as opposed to the yield on stocks now the yield on stocks has been a non-issue for basically the last 20 20 20 or 30 years ever since the tech bubble blew up uh, all of the companies that participated in the tech bubble or not all but virtually all of the companies in the tech boom um, didn't pay any dividends. So everything in the stock market for roughly the last 25 to 30 years is just capital appreciation. Right. It's just, 
just making gains on on you know sell it to a, a bigger sucker basically buy buy high and sell higher sort of thing so uh as to how as to how if that rule is going to apply you know the three steps and a stumble we don't know but it, it may because uh you know the the bear market in bonds is 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 pretty sharp. I mean, a lot of people didn't think we were going to get, you know, ever see decent short-term rates again. But you know, the two-year note has, has sold off pretty hard. And um, then there's the other factor of, you know, I'm looking at the tech stocks, and uh, you know, I think it's coinciding with the sort of censorship that we're seeing out of the tech community. It's not just, uh, it's not just the social media, you know, it, it's, it's almost all of Silicon Valley, almost all tech seems to be going in the same direction. And, uh, they're just kind of like left wing, uh, what's the latest meme NPCs. So they just all think the same. They all do the same thing. And we're seeing all of those stocks, which are basically the front runners of this of this phase of the bull market, you know, your Googles, mm -hmm. your Facebooks, your Twitters, your Amazons, your Netflix, these stocks have had ridiculous runs percentage wise. Some of them are up 20 fold, some of them are up 50 fold, um, way more than the Dow is, even though the Dow and the S&P are up a good, um, well, I think uh, with the S&P bottom at 666, ran all the way to almost 3,000. The Dow was in the 6,000s and we came up to 27,000. So, I mean, when you pull up that chart, that's a very, very uh, nearing parabolic type of spike. I mean, it actually makes the, the market run to near 15,000 before the 2008 recession. It, it dwarfs it. So, um, you know, I'm actually on stocks. I'm actually thinking. I was looking at a lot of charts lately. I'm thinking that it probably would be ironic if we touched that 27,000 and headed back down to that 2,700, which was the high we hit in 1987, which would be a 90% bar market in stocks. And most people think that can't happen. It, trust me, it can happen, and it has happened. Um, there have been many 90% bear markets in different stock markets around the world, and that's just the way markets work. Uh, when when a real bear market starts, it just keeps going down and down and down and down. And when you think capitulation has finally come, it hasn't come. Just ask the Japanese. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that can definitely happen here. Uh, it would not surprise me to see the Dow go from that 27,000 all the way back down to that old high in 1987 of 2700. Now, that's if they allow a deflation to take hold. But we don't know if they're going to do that. We don't know if they're going to fire up the printing presses. And, you know, that gets that gets into the fiscal picture, which is really ugly. I know that President Trump wants to, you know, toot his horn about, you know, how great things are ahead of these elections. But the fact of the matter is, is that we're now running an annual one point two five trillion dollar uh, deficit. Uh, they're going to tell you it's 800 or something, but you can just do the math yourself. Just pull up debt to the penny and pull up October 19th a year ago and put in October 19th of this year, and you'll see the difference between those two two amounts is about $1.25 trillion. So, you know, with interest rates normalizing, you know, our tax revenues are only about $3 trillion. So interest rates normalizing, um, the debt being 21 and a half trillion or so, uh, we're not far from a fiscal crisis, and I just don't see any anybody talking or dealing with it. You also mentioned uh, signs that demonstrated we're near recession uh, in the economy. You want to talk about that as well? Yeah, I mean, there's some. I, I, I'm looking at uh, I'm looking at oil right now, and let me pull up the oil chart here real quick. Um, it's pretty ugly. I mean, oil has gone down from, we know the, the big high that it had, 
uh, before the 2008 recession, it got up that near that $150 price. But we're kind of rolling over in a bear phase now after a rally from you know about 30 bucks, and we're around 66 bucks, and it is definitely uh, breaking down technically. So we're seeing oil break down, um, and also things like lumber. Lumber's already down about 50%. Um, that's usually a leading indicator of the housing market. Right. A lot of this money that has gone into uh, stocks, you know, the housing market has shared a lot of that printed money um, where we've gone from, I don't remember what the number was, but I think when Barack Obama came into office, we were under 10 trillion in the national debt and we're over 21 now. Um, you look at the Fed, the Fed's balance sheet, you know, uh, like I said about the stock market, it, w it was 2700 in 1987 and it just hit 27,000. Are, are we 10 times wealthier today than we were in 1987? I don't think so. So you, seeing these some of these commodities roll over gives you an indication that, you know, the economy is probably going to soften. I know people like Peter Schiff and others are talking about how we're getting very close to being overdue for the next recession. It's very unusual to go more than 10 years without having a downturn. And in a lot of ways, the last downturn was kind of papered over. We really didn't, it wasn't a traditional recession in the sense that we took the pain. You know, we, we sort of we sort of become like, you know, heroin junkies. We, we don't ever want to take the pain. We just keep getting further and further strung out. And, uh, you know, eventually you have to take the pain. And the longer you wait to face it, the worse it is. And so that tells me this one's going to be the worst. I mean, the worst ever, probably in world history. But that's what everybody's been predicting for a long time. Um, I'm long, personally, I don't give investment advice, but my own investments, I'm long out of any type of paper assets for quite some time. Back when we spoke with you last, your main focus then was physical silver. You were also starting to talk about some cryptocurrencies, and we've also seen a significant run-up and then volatility in the cryptocurrencies over the past year since we spoke with you. Uh, why don't you update us quickly on what you see happening in the crypto space in general, and then we'll zero in on your new your new uh, adventure. Absolutely. Well, uh, I think when we talked, the market cap of cryptocurrency market was roughly a hundred billion dollars which sounds like a lot of money but when we're talking about the money that's sloshing around in the system in derivatives and stocks and real estate it's just it's a rounding error of a rounding error and I think we ran from that hundred billion to I predicted when we talked uh, I said we probably hit a trillion by the end of the year actually what happened was Bitcoin just took off and ran to 20,000 um, then a bunch of new ones came on and ran really hard, Ethereum and some others, and we got about $850 billion market cap. And then in December, we had Wall Street come in with their derivatives. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had some other real shady stuff uh, going on, like on the Bitcoin Foundation, we had sort of a purge. And we had Brock Pierce, a real shady character, come in there. And so... You know, there's been a sort of a intrusion of the financial elites into the crypto space. I personally think there's a lot of shenanigans going on on the exchanges. I think there's a lot of suppression. I think they're selling fake Bitcoin, just like they sell fake silver. But uh, there's a little bit of a difference because, uh, you know, to call them on silver, you have to take delivery. And... People just don't want to deal with delivery. You know, I mean, I like it because it, when I sock away physical silver, it, it's a big pain in the butt to sell it again. And, and that's good because that means you're going to hang on to it. With cryptocurrencies, it's different. Um, I can ask for delivery with the click of a mouse. So if I own Bitcoin on an exchange um, I, and I get worried about something, I'm going to click withdraw. And there's going to be my 0. 0.0005 
fee and that Bitcoin better hit my wallet within five minutes or there's going to be hell to pay. So you can take delivery with cryptocurrencies. So it's much harder to use counterfeits to suppress the price as they do in the precious metals. So, but they did, they instituted some counterfeiting, they instituted some fake exchanges, they, you know, they've made it so it's very difficult to uh, trade because you can't leave it overnight on the exchange, your exchange can go bankrupt, there's all kinds of stuff. But at the same time, I said initially, way back in 2011, when I started doing videos on Bitcoin, that uh, it was the idea. I didn't know whether Bitcoin was going to be the coin that would take out uh, the central bankers, but a cryptocurrency would do that. Now, what they're saying now is, oh, well, it's blockchain. The blockchain technology, this is the, this is the latest propaganda from the financial powers that be to try to discredit true decentralized peer-to-peer -peer, uh, cryptocurrencies. And uh, so, the, well, no, it's not Bitcoin, it's just the blockchain. And, you know, and so many people have talked about this, Andreas Antonopoulos, and uh, everybody who knows anything about Bitcoin knows that the term blockchain is meaningless if you're not talking about Bitcoin. Um, you're just talking about uh, some spreadsheet. Even Nuriel Rubini in his latest testimony where he, by the way, it was absolutely destroyed. Uh, if you get a chance, watch that before Congress. But, uh, you know, it just becomes a glorified spreadsheet. So, no, block, a, a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer cryptocurrency is absolutely essential to blockchain technology. You can't have one without the other. So that doesn't mean that Bitcoin is going to be it. Some other coin may be it. But the coin that is it will be a decentralized coin, and it's going to be a coin that goes out. Uh, on its own and isn't controlled by any government, any central power. There's no central point of failure. Decentralization is going to be the key. And that's what you mentioned uh, next for me is uh, coins, decentralized uh, social media, which is it's, it's due right now. And uh, fortunately, it's arrived. We've certainly had lots of discussion over the past year about de facto censorship on the major flagship uh, commercial media platform, uh, uh, YouTube, and among others. Uh, we've had, in the last two months or so, we've had a number of high-profile, uh, outspoken uh, personalities on those platforms uh, delisted or lose their lose their. Um, sites or their channels or, or their uh, we've had uh, Sean Turnbull and a number of others um, what uh, what are the evidence of censorship that gave you concern about the viability for independent true independent voices on these commercial platforms well I actually uh, experienced what these people are experience, experiencing I experienced it back in 2012 so uh, my videos started to be demonetized uh, started to be, I had multiple threats of lawsuits, takedowns, harassment, uh, you name it, everything. Now, I didn't get outright banned, but I could see the writing on the wall. And so back in 2013, I decided that uh, these, these centralized social media platforms would no longer be uh, a source of revenue for alternative opinions. And so at that point, I had a decent following. I think I had maybe 15,000 subscribers on one channel, and then I had maybe 10,000 or 15,000 on another. And I just announced that I was taking everything to a member site, set up my own member site, did the hosting, and all of the nightmares of hiring people to get things done. And and trust me, it's a, it's a gigantic nightmare. But we got that set up, had members pay $10 a month or whatever it was, and this is before Patreon, before anyone was doing that. So we ran that way and uh, just hosted them on YouTube unlisted and then let the members be the only ones that viewed them. It worked okay, but it, it's, based, it's sort of kind of like being silenced. So um, now, just recently, I've migrated everything, all my content from YouTube to BitTube bit.tube, which I personally believe is going to be the new YouTube because it is a 
cryptocurrency based decentralized video media platform that is censorship resistant and uh, is based on a cryptocurrency and doesn't isn't based on an ad model but is based on a uh, airtime model when you talk about decentralized that's been one of the concerns about some of the main platforms is that they are uh, centrally hosted and there's a one decision maker in charge and you, you can that's it you're if you get turned off whether it's demonetization or whether it's flat out uh, one two three strikes you're off you're considered um, whatever not fit for the community anymore or whatever uh, what does decentralized mean in the terms of bit.tube well decentralized means uh, you know just the same thing as it does with cryptocurrencies so the way that the blockchain works um, you know, Bitcoin is kind of partially based on the idea of BitTorrent. And if you remember back in the history of file sharing, there were there was the Napsters of the world, and uh, there were software programs where you could, uh, if you had a bunch of songs on your computer, you could go out and uh, connect with somebody else who has other songs, and you could share your songs and. What happened with Napster was that Napster got shut down by the RIAA, the MPAA, the government, all the copyright people, the copyright cabal. So they shut them down, and uh, BitTorrent sort of took its place. So BitTorrent was uh, sort of an evolution. It was decentralized. Napster was one central location. You go to Napster.com. BitTorrent, on the other hand, was just this a whole bunch of different uh, links, magnet links to content that some people were seeding. So if you wanted to get a copy of a movie, you could go to a site, any number of sites that had that magnet link. You could click on that and that, through your torrent software that would link you up with, say, another 500 people who have seeds and peers that have a copy of that file. You share that file. Well, what happened with that was that... Uh, they attacked the domain hosting. We know they arrested the guys from the Pirate Bay, and we know all that story. So it wasn't truly decentralized in that sense. Uh, but Bitcoin sort of borrowed the idea that you want something that's truly decentralized. You don't want it to have any single point of failure. You want it to be designed like the internet so that if it's a giant web, so you could go and just say that a whole state got hit by a volcano blast and it just took out the entire state. Well, all the surrounding states would still be up on the internet because it's a giant web. Same sort of concept with Bitcoin, which Bitcoin actually did, successfully implemented that. It was decentralized, peer-to-peer, -peer, no central point of failure, no point of attack. They could not stop it. Well, that's the same model that we want to see in media. We want to have things hosted uh, not at one central point where one person can say, that's it, you're banned. And uh, there's a network now called the IPFS network, which is what BitTube is based on. And it is, it's an advancement above what Torrent is. And so it's just all of the content uh, stored all over the internet and little tiny pieces that can be thrown back together and is censorship resistant. And that's what has been implemented in BitTube. There was a criticism recently on, by one of our guests talking about the vulnerability of Bitcoin really only consisting of like 7,000 nodes globally, that if they could all be taken over or shut down or whatever by, by some uh, either a country or a company or a some clever hacker or whatever is, is there first of all do you have information to confirm or deny that uh, assessment of the vulnerability of Bitcoin and then secondly how does the how does the the uh, distribution or decentralization of BitTube compare well Bitcoin has always I mean the developers have always talked about the the dangers of a 51% attack but though uh, and a, just briefly a 51% attack is just if one group of miners. The miners are the people who process the transactions. They're the people who are mining, trying to discover the next block of Bitcoins, but they're also processing transactions. So um, you, 
in any cryptocurrency, you can have a fork, which is a hard fork is where uh, you have basically uh, any cryptocurrency is just one gigantic distributed ledger. Everybody has a copy of this particular ledger. If you have a fork, then that means that uh, there's the one ledger is split into two, and then going forward, there are different records kept in each ledger. So that's when the coin forks. Now, potentially, a coin could be forked by a 51% attack in theory, but not really. It's overblown. Uh, so you can't lose your coins because of it. Um, it it's, it's theoretical, but it's pretty much never been seen. It's only been seen on very, very small cryptocurrencies. And again, it doesn't go away. It just becomes another fork of it. So it's it's definitely an overblown threat. Uh, the the mining on on Bitcoin is already so much larger than any super supercomputer that anybody has. Um, a lot of people have concern because there's so many in China. But I mean, the the Bitcoin miners are going to migrate to wherever uh, the power is cheapest. There's, going to be, there's a tremendous number in Iceland as well because the cooling is cheap and the power is cheap. But uh, I don't see anything right now. I, I see the Bitcoin Foundation as being much more of a threat to Bitcoin than a 51% attack. But at the same time, there's 2,000 other cryptocurrencies out there. And we have to remember the big picture. The big picture is that Bitcoin is the first true peer-to-peer -peer decentralized cryptocurrency that allows one person with a computer to send any amount of value to another person anywhere in the world with a click of a button. That remains true. Um, now, BitTube is just another cryptocurrency that's exactly like Bitcoin. It's decentralized peer-to-peer, -peer, um, except that it's integrated with a media platform. And so you get paid in those two coins to watch videos as well as get paid to provide content. So it solves the problem. There's a lot of people going to Patreon. There's a lot of people going to BitChute. There's a lot of people going to DTube. There's a lot of people going to Real.Video. But all of those suffer from one form or another of the old centralized single point of attack problem. Whereas BitTube is one of the first uh, media media cryptocurrencies to come out that that solves all those problems and uh how exactly you, you mentioned people can get paid for watching videos and people can get paid for for po posting videos but where does the pay what is the form of the payment and where does it come from uh the form of the payment is tube t-u-b-e it's a coin that's traded on bittrex it's traded on uh, trade over it's traded on a whole bunch of other exchanges and uh there's a billion will eventually be mined. Right now, there's only roughly 100 million in existence. They come into creation the way, just the way Bitcoin did. It was mined. Um, there was no ICO, you know, the, the big scam. That's another trick the Wall Streeters did was they created, I personally believe that they created Ethereum. And Ethereum was used to blow up this gigantic ICO scam market. And then what happened was uh, all these people who had people send them all their Ethereum for their ICO, they just walked away with the money. Well, that doesn't really have anything to do with cryptocurrencies. That's just outright fraud. Um, but uh, BitTube is not based on that. It's based on the original model that Bitcoin was, that the people who get the coin, they're mined into existence. The people who started it didn't assign themselves any coin. They just... Uh, once, when the miners mine it, a certain percentage goes to the broadcaster, a certain percentage goes to the viewer, and then a small percentage goes to overhead. I think 5% goes to overhead and maintaining the network and things like that. So the idea is to create a media platform where content creators can get paid in a cryptocurrency that, in my opinion, will go much higher in value that people can buy and they can also earn, so uh, it cuts out the ad model completely. It uses a new model called, called airtime model. So you're paid not based on ads that people click on. And as everyone knows, if I don't know if you've seen the interview, but if, if you haven't, definitely catch his latest book by George Gilder talking about Google and why it's absolutely doomed 
and, and it's doomed to be destroyed because its whole model is broken and uh, the whole ad-based model is ridiculous. As, as George Gilder pointed out in his latest video, only about 0.03% of ads that go onto mobile devices are actually wanted and clicked on, and yet they constitute a significant percentage of the bandwidth of that network. So this whole ad-based model is broken. And BitTube, uh, BitTube and the airtime model completely solves that because content creators get paid for the minutes that they're watched and uh, viewers get paid for how long they're watching. It's a fascinating and, uh, and I guess it's because it's new, it's a bit bewildering model of where the value, how, how the pay comes from, but you're saying it comes from the mining of these, of these new tube coins. Well, the value comes from people seeing value and buying it. For example, how much money does it cost to set up a Patreon account and to have people subscribe to you and pay you $10 a month, which probably comes through PayPal. There's the overhead of that money system. There's all this stuff built into it. I know because I had that member yeah, site. Yeah, sure. So people have to, they have to sign up with PayPal. They have to sign up with Patreon. They have to fund it with their bank account. Then they have to connect this. They have to do this, do that, do that, do this. As opposed to this, where you can just go out and buy the coin and it'll probably go up. I personally think it's going to go up a thousandfold. I think it's going to be the next YouTube, but that's just my opinion. But you can just buy the coin or you can earn the coin and that allows you to pay the people that you want to watch. So if you have somebody who's very valuable, who people really want to watch, then they could set a, a fairly small uh, amount of cost or no cost at all. And they're going to get paid until... Those, all those coins are mined. Now, that's the big question people have asked about Bitcoin. What about when all the coins are mined? Well, when all the coins are mined, then the miners are going to make the fees of the transactions. Same thing with BitTube. When finally, we've only got a tenth of the existing coins mined, but finally, when all the coins are mined, um, then they're just going to be worth the value of that model. And trust me, that model is very, very valuable. I'm already on there. Um, I've earned, um, you know, thousands of, of tube coins for the views that I've gotten, which, you know, unfortunately I wasn't able to take a lot of my subs from YouTube because they, they banned my ability to communicate with my subs and they did all kinds of crazy stuff to me. I don't really care. So, but uh, anybody who wants to migrate from YouTube over to BitTube uh, is very simple. It's just sign up, get your email and uh, you can just pull all your videos right off of YouTube and suck them right into BitTube. Uh, there haven't really been any big names that uh, have discovered it yet. I may be one of the biggest content creators on there, but I see that Jeff Berwick from Dollar Vigilante is set up on there now. I see Luke Rodowski of We Are Change on there. There's FPS Russia is on there. So there's some people now, some of the first, you know, the first people to find something are kind of discovering it. But yeah, uh, it's just like Bitcoin. Um, uh, if they do fail, which I don't think they will, it's an incredible development team, but if they do fail, they've proven that it works. The idea is out there. There will be decentralized media. This censorship model, this centralized server model where the government or whoever controls Google, whether it's the Illuminati banksters or, you know, uh, blood-sucking reptiles, who knows controls these companies, you know, will not be able to say to you, I don't like what you just said. You're not getting paid. In fact, you're banned. That won't exist anymore. The people will be able to decide what they want to watch. So it's very exciting. I see why this fits with your previous mantra of silver for the people. If we could just close back by circling back, kind of back to the beginning and uh, talk to us about what forms of physical silver you think um, might make the most sense. I know you're not giving financial advice here, but uh, when you've when you've talked with ordinary people that want to have some hedge against the uh, out of control, uh, inflated derivatives and risk exposure and debt and everything that's going on in our in our so-called uh, mainstream financial world, uh, what kinds of uh, physical silver holdings uh, have people convinced you uh, are were, are the most worthy of people looking into for an individual homeowner individual. Well, for me, um, coins uh, are definitely the, the top choice. 
Uh, for the small investor, I don't think you can go wrong with junk silver, especially when the premiums are low. You have to keep an eye on premiums, um, but if you go to, say, CompareSilverPrices.com and look up there, you can see you compare the different sites, Atmex and Provident Metals and Jambolian and Silver Doctors and look at them all, and you can see you know, who's charging the most premium. And if, if junk silver premiums are, are good, then, yeah, it, it can't be beat because, you know, you're not going to face the risk of counterfeiting, although you know, silver is so low value. But there are Chinese knockoffs. So that that's probably the first choice. The second choice for me and what I was telling my member site people finding picks and buying myself was uh, semi-numismatic uh, coins. Now, I'm not talking about numismatic coins uh, because I consider those to be a scam. I'm not talking about something with some ridiculous premium. I'm talking about something with a little better, a uh, little higher premium than, say, Silver Eagles, which can have a you know pretty good premium. Mm -hmm. But usually the ones I, I've looked at, in fact, pretty much have bought since about 2008 has pretty much been Perth Lunar Series, which is the based on the Chinese calendar uh, from the Perth Mint in Australia, and uh, they have uh, every year it's the whatever the Chinese uh, animal that's on the coin. They're very very high quality. They also come in capsules, so every single coin is uh, in in its own plastic capsule. They they traditionally have only been about a buck more than silver eagles, uh, but they're becoming very, very hard to get. You can still get them. I had to actually move to buying the half ounce ones because uh, the year, some of the year of the dragon ones and stuff like that started going for 75 bucks an ounce, which was ridiculous. So, uh, But in the early days, you could get them very, very cheaply. You still can. They're very hard to find. And I think that the Australian government just really doesn't want to part with much silver. I mean, the, the Australian government knows that silver – is very very valuable and and it's losing every time it sells one of those so they're they're hard to find but if you can find a half ounce um, for like ten bucks or something or one ounce for say twenty bucks or a little bit over uh, I found that those coins maintain their their value on, and, and even significantly appreciate on the market um, you know some of the Tigers that I bought, the Silver Tigers, which was a 2010 Tiger. I think they're going for 70 bucks now uh, for the one ounce and about 50 bucks for the half ounce. And that's not, you know, that I'm not talking to you about Atmax selling them. I'm talking to you about on eBay. People are actually mm -hmm. paying that price for those coins. So that's that's my favorite uh, or my second favorite. Junk Silver is number one, absolutely. And uh, then start looking at good semi numismatics. There's some other neat ones out there. There's some Somali elephants that really appreciate. And if you study it, uh, if you go and study eBay and what things are reselling for, and then study ones that have decent premiums above spot, you can find some ones that are worth holding on to, even in a bear market. Hmm. Yeah, we've certainly heard that Perth Mint has a real good reputation for product integrity and so on um, over the years. It's remained a, sort of a perennial favorite. Well, I think that's all the time that we had for tonight. Uh, Brother John F., it's been a delight having you back on after this long absence, and we hope that it won't be nearly as long until we can have you back on again. First of all, to give us an update on, on what you're seeing happening on the precious metals markets and cryptos, as well as the economy as a whole, but also uh, for an update on how things are going on BitTube. But if people want to check that out, go to bit.tube. Um, and uh, see what you got there. Uh, there's quite a bit of content already out there, and, and I understand more arriving every day. Yeah, thanks again, Dan. Again, you can find me. I have two channels over there. I've migrated Brother John F. and the Bitcoin channel. You can find my videos on bit.tube. Thanks again, Dan. Again. <laughs>